there. My name is Johnny. Uh, I've been doing jujitsu for about almost two years now. Uh, we, I train at Cal BJJ in Ethiopia, which is also the only Brazilian jujitsu school in the country of 100 million plus population. Yo, so we are coming to you from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia today. We are headed out to Tokyo and we're gonna have a layover in Ethiopia. And rather than do two really long flights back to back, we opted to stay for a few more days. <clears throat> so right now we're at Unity Park in Addis and there's some really cool like gardens you can walk through and there's a zoo. Elevation is really high here, so it's nearly 8,000 feet above sea level. So if you're used to living at sea level, definitely makes a difference. So for perspective, Denver is one of the highest elevation cities in the US and it's uh, like 5,000 feet above sea level. They call it the mile high city and this one's sitting at 8,000 feet. So you'll definitely feel it. We'll get some footage we're gonna do a bit of jits later, and then just some sightseeing around the city. So I'm en route to Cal BJJ in Addis Ababa, which to my knowledge is the only jiu-jitsu club in Addis Ababa, maybe in Ethiopia. Um, so yeah, I've been following them on Instagram. Looks like a pretty solid club. I know they have at least one black belt teacher there, handful of uh, brown, purple, blue belts. So uh, should be a good time. Gonna go in there tonight, try to get a roll in with as many people as I can try to learn something uh, I'm little I'm a little curious to see how the elevation affects me because I spent the last several years at sea level basically and now I'm a mile and a half above sea level so who knows maybe it'll be a non-factor maybe I'll be uh,
It's a really cool club. There's good energy here. There's uh, 27 people on the mat space right now. 27, 28. It looks like everyone's well trained. There's some uh, wide variety of like uh, body types and stuff. It's, it is really a nice place to train. So looking forward to being here the next few days. My name's Colin Stewart. I'm a jiu-jitsu black belt under Team Choke Lab. I started training in 2005 under Aaron Morris out of Philadelphia, and uh, I'm still affiliated with Aaron's program. About three years ago, I, I moved to Ethiopia for work, and uh, I really wanted to find a jiu-jitsu program here. I went to gyms all over the city. I couldn't find anything. Uh, I offered to coach at gyms. I offered to bring mats to the gyms and coach at the gyms. And I couldn't find anything. And uh, I, I, I really needed it. Jiu-Jitsu becomes an addiction for folks. And uh, I'm definitely part of that crowd. So after about six weeks of just walking to random gyms and asking them where I can do jujitsu and nobody's ever heard of it, it I finally reached out to uh, an email I found online. It's an international judo federation. And they linked me up with a guy named Dr. Sagaya. He's an Ethiopian diaspora living in Germany. And he's invested a lot of time, a lot of, of his personal money in uh, Ethiopian judo and uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu. And he put me in touch with Yared and through email. 
And all I knew was there was a guy named Yared who did jiu-jitsu in Ethiopia. So I reached out to Yared. I said, hey, man, I'm a black belt. Uh, I'll be here for two years. I'd really like to train. And um, he sent me back an email. I said, we train Monday night. I said, okay. I wrote back, gi or no gi, what time? Uh, where do I go? So he gave me all the details. I showed up that Monday night. And I walked into class. And, and Yared was a 135-pound blue belt. And he ran the class, and uh, I was a black belt, about 185 pounds, taking it, taking a blue belt's class, and and he owned it, and I really respected that he he ran his class. I was taking his class, and I rolled with him during the class, and during the roll, I, I thought to myself, man, I, this guy, this guy's a, a blue belt. Like, what's going on here? And uh, I got to know him over time, um, and I got to know more about the program. Uh, he didn't put—he wasn't on social media. The team didn't have a team name because, as a blue belt, he didn't feel like he could advertise the program. But um, Ethiopia is known for having a lot of fake martial artists, and uh, he actually told me later after he got to know me that when I emailed him and I was like, "Hey, I'm a black belt, and I'm here in town." He sent his buddy a text. He's like, listen to this bullshit guy who claims he's a black belt. Like, we'll find out on Monday night. So uh, I became real good friends with the Arrett. He got his blue belt at Gracie Baja in Italy. He had the opportunity to train out there. But um, he didn't have any path forward. And he was actually give, about to give up on jiu-jitsu in Ethiopia. And um, I, I pushed him. Uh, I, I kind of forced him to come up with a team name. And then... Um, my professor, Aaron Morris, back in Philadelphia, he, he said, listen, if these guys don't have a path forward, I'll pay for them to become affiliated with our team, and, and we're, we're going to create that path forward. And he, Aaron just put the onus on me. He's like, you're the head coach. you got to run this. you got to run it right. So for the next two years, uh, that's, that's what I did. And within six months, Yarrett got promoted to Purple Belt. We had six or seven new Blue Belts. We went to Angola and competed at the African Championship. That's awesome. Down there, we got the uh, we got the model for how to grow jiu-jitsu in, in Africa. Angola's got legit jiu-jitsu. Brazilian guys came to Angola in the early 2000s for work, taught some guys jiu-jitsu. I know one of the guys, Flavio, who was one of the first black belts in, uh, in Angola, he set up the first tournament in Angola. And I, I remember sitting sitting at uh, the pool, drinking some Angolan beer by myself after our guys learned how good Angolans were at jiu-jitsu. And I was like, man, shit, shit. Like, how are we going to close this gap? This is crazy. And Flavio, he told me, he's like, it's easy, man. All you need to do is introduce competition and everybody levels up. So all you need is two schools. And I, I remember, man, it was a dark night. I'm just sitting there drinking beers by myself being like, we only got one. We have one school. Like, this is how are we going to do this? Yeah. And I just sat there and Yared came out and I was like, Yared, we're splitting the team in half. We're going blue and red and we're running a tournament next month. And that's how we did our first tournament here. They've had six or seven now. We call them the Warrior King Open, WKO. And, uh, and, and the program's really grown since then. They've, uh, my, my instructor, my professor, Aaron, he created his own team last year, Team Choke Lab. Yeah. And Kyle BJJ is now under Team Choke Lab. And they have a path forward through an internationally recognized team from now until forever through Team Choke Lab to get promotions, to grow the program. And like now our biggest impediments are just gear. We, there's no geese in this country. Nobody's ever heard of jiu-jitsu except the guys in the room. Uh, there's no rash guards. There's no, no gi shorts, no mouthpieces. Uh, so we beg, borrow, and steal, and we get the stuff here. Uh, but, but that's really our biggest struggle now. So the program was a pickup basketball game. It, it was seven, eight guys. Uh, sometimes it'd be a purple belt running a class, but usually it was just seven, eight guys just doing what they wanted to do. Uh, that's at the point in time when I showed up. There were a lot of different folks who came through town before me who could be dedicated to the program. I, I don't know all of their history, so I don't, I don't try to tell it. But there's a history before me. Um, but when I showed up, it, it was like a pickup basketball game. And the analogy I like to use is they went from pickup basketball game to like travel club to where they had organization, they had structure, they had, and they felt like they had a path forward. When I talked to these guys, uh, the guys that I met that first week, uh, it was, they'd been training for years. They were white belts. 
I remember it was about five months after I got here, I promoted some guys to blue belt. And they said, I thought I would be a white belt forever. Like there was no belt progression possibility in our future. And we were just happy doing jujitsu. We had white belt mafia t-shirts that we wore because we, we thought we were gonna be wearing those shirts forever. So, so that's one of the biggest changes. And then for our, what people tell me, there's two things that they tell me that so, surprise, it wasn't what I set out to do. Uh, the first one is community, the community that the guys have here. Um, it's hard to find a community in Ethiopia that's as tight as these guys. And they sweat and they bleed on each other, so it, it makes sense if they're close. But um, we have people who leave the program who keep coming to our parties <laughs> because they, they love the community. And then the other one, uh, they also found mentorship through the program. Uh, a few guys have reached out to me. They told me it's difficult to find uh, good mentors in Ethiopia, but through this program, they found some. Yeah, thank you. All right. All good, man. There's one of them. There's one of them. <laughs> so uh, th that's what people tell me. Um, I, I think that's a great question to ask the guys, too. But that's what they tell me that isn't what I came here to do. I came here for jujitsu. Um, my, my instructor, Aaron, he always has a big focus on community, so that, that was natural for me to build the community. Uh, but I wasn't expecting the reaction that the guys gave me in terms of how important that was to them. Thanks, bro. Release the head, boom. All right. All right, so this one is the uh, same thing to our blast double, it's a little bit different though. Um, the other one, we got a trail hand, club, circle. Okay, this one, everything is your dominant side. So, like I said, I don't want to do anything looping or like swinging from the outside, but for this one, I'm just going to kind of pop them with my lead hand. I just pop them in the shoulder to get a reaction, then I'm switching to my club. It's like boom, boom. And as I do that, I'm circling to that same side. So it's right hand post, right hand flow, and now I'm circling to the right. Moving my okay. Now, whenever I'm ready to shoot, I just level change and release the head go. So I release, right to my double, and drive. Okay. Post. Release. Hands locked below the butt. Hips come in, head comes up. This is the position you want to be in when you're double. Okay. Now, if I can lift, get his hands off the mat, let the legs go pass. And let me see it again.
introduce yourself. Uh, hey there, my name is Johnny. Uh, I've been doing jujitsu for about almost two years now. Uh, we I train at Kao BJJ in Ethiopia, which is also the only Brazilian jujitsu school in the country of 100 million plus population. So, so uh, I got into jujitsu. About two years ago, I used to work at the radio station, and one of my guests happened to be a white belt here. And she told me that she did jujitsu. And after that, I just signed up. Two months into the sport, I ended up quitting my job and doing it full time, training eight hours a day. And here we are, two years later. No regrets. The thing that made me fell in love with the sport, especially uh, here, the, the gym environment that our coach has created is where everyone is so eager and willing to share information and even though you have a competition against one of your teammates a month from now they're doing everything in their power to try to get me to be better than them and it's kind of rare to see this in this country where almost there it's a norm to for people to keep or give you limited forms of information so that you don't outshine them or for the fear of you being better than them and that kind of stood out to me the camaraderie the culture everyone is super nice uh, it's rare to find like-minded people where you can you know effortlessly interact with one another and we we found it here when i first came in uh, there was only a or four blue belts now we have over more than 10. Uh, when i came in we were all beginners we most of us didn't know how to shrimp. There weren't there weren't dedicated athletes to the sport. Now we have people training seven times a week who are obsessed with the sport, and you know, every, there are people willing to make the sacrifice necessary to take it to the next level. Uh, I don't think it had that. There was only one or two people that were doing that uh, a while back, which is two years ago or so. So far, you know, looking forward, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel to Nairobi and soon I'll be going to Algeria to compete. And from what I've seen, even in Africa, there's people who are dedicated to the sport. And when I say dedicated, they're not as hobbyists. There are people training almost on a regular basis. And I feel like it takes those type of individuals to grow the sport. I mean, I've traveled to Nairobi to fight, and if we organize a competition, there are people from different parts of Africa will come in and compete just to uh, just to have that, you know, uh, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word, yeah, that, that exposure, uh, the experience. I know my level has up, uh, has changed since my tournament in Nairobi. Uh, when I went there, I was just a normal blue belt, and I came in a few more competitions later. Now I'm one of the most competitive uh, blue belts, I could say, in the country, which isn't saying much, but tra traveling around uh, and seeing what other gyms have to offer, I feel like compared to where we were at, we're creating really good grapplers, and we're just getting started. So, you know, one of the in the future for me personally, one of the people that I look up to are people, uh, is people like John Danahar. They're not necessarily competitors. But there are people that started the sport at a very late stage in their lives but, and somehow found a way to con contribute to the sport um, in ways that are, uh, well, we're living thousands of miles away from where they're at and we're using their contents to upgrade ourselves. I have almost all of his instructions and I just watch him almost every day. So I, I, I hope to create athletes around Ethiopia and Africa. I feel like I'm a bit too old, I'll still compete because I'm healthy. Uh, but my goal is to create as many fighters as I can and to educate myself in the sport of jiu-jitsu in the next 20-30 years. That long-term commitment kind of draws me to it. So hopefully, we all think, if everything works out, uh, we'll be having a different conversation 10 years, 20 years down the line.